Good afternoon, everybody. I'm hoping that everybody can hear me. Um, let Olivia know if you can't. Um, firstly, great to be with so many of you this afternoon. I mean, gosh, these are unprecedented times. Uh, we're going through things that we never thought we'd have to go through. Um, certainly nothing we've been through before. And the government, to be fair to them, you may criticise them on many things, but when it comes to trying to sort all of us out in this uh, difficult time, I have to say I'm pretty amazed by how quickly they've moved with sorting out employment rights and helping us through this difficult time. Um, so you will know that there was a coronavirus bill that was proposed. Um, that became law as of yesterday. So we now have the Coronavirus Act, which I'm not going to go into in any detail, where it doesn't relate to employment, but I am going to deal with those points that are um, effectively relating to the matters that us as HR people um, and employment lawyers will be dealing with. So first topic that I was going to tick off, and I appreciate these may not be in the order um, that Yasmin has sent out on her email, but um, I'm just going to start off with sick pay. Um, I think uh, because that's such a big topic for everybody and there is some confusion around what people should be having and, uh, and not having. Um, from the uh, Coronavirus Act, um, the first change of course is that statutory sick pay is payable from day one. Uh, there is no longer three waiting days uh, where it relates to uh, absence con concerning uh, where statutory sick pay would be payable. So that for the foreseeable future and certainly for the next two years where that may be necessary, where it's connected to coronavirus, um, it will be that statutory sick pay is payable from um, day one. In addition, um, you can claim back up to 14 days of statutory sick pay. So the first two weeks of absence is reclaimable from the government. So your organisation can also do that. Now, there's a lot of, I think, uncertainty around who gets paid what depending on why they're home. So let's just tackle that and whether if you've got somebody that is at home, whether they will get statutory sick pay or whether they've got any other entitlements. So if you've got somebody that is self-isolating because they've been advised to do so by public England, Wales or Scotland, um, or they phone the NHS uh, 111 line and they've been informed that they must self-isolate, then in that situation, the guidance is saying that they should receive statutory sick pay. Now, we will have, because I know that I'm dealing with questions on this all the time, some individuals who take the view that the world is now coming to an end, which I'm pretty sure it won't, although it's difficult. Um, they are worried that they, uh, the entire world is going to come to an end. So they're staying at home um, and saying that they're not going to come to work and they're self-isolating to prevent themselves from getting the virus. In that situation, where they're not complying or been advised to do so with Public Health England, then they're not entitled to receive statutory sick pay. We then come on to the grouping of individuals that are required to socially distance, which we know are the vulnerable group, those over 70, those with certain conditions, and pregnant workers, and whether they would be entitled to statutory sick pay if they are social distancing. And the answer to that, is, again, is no, because they are not are self-isolating to prevent the spread of the virus. So just to be clear, if somebody is socially distancing, they're not entitled to statutory sick pay. However, those individuals that may well be um, socially distancing will be uh, working from home. Potentially, if they're working from home, then you may be paying them as normal. Or of course, there's the opportunity to consider whether furlough leave is something that you could put in place for these individuals. And we're gonna go on to deal with furlough leave later on. In addition to those elements, there's also the isolation notes issue. Um, if you have individuals who are self-isolating, then obviously they can uh, produce statutory sick, um, be certified for the first seven days. If uh, they are uh, requiring to self-isolate for longer, then they can go online and use the online isolation notes process. Now, Company sick pay. So a lot of questions have also been posed around whether individuals will receive company sick pay. Um, two arguments in relation to this, whether sick means actually sick, because of course, if you're self-isolating with no symptoms, then you may not be deemed actually sick. Um, and whether sick has to be in the same way that it's construed for the purposes of statutory sick pay. I take the view that if you have somebody who is self-isolating, they would not be entitled to company sick pay um, in relation to any absence, but only statutory sick pay. 
Moving on to suspension. Now, suspension, I don't mean in the, from the point of view of gross misconduct, disciplinary investigations. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about medical suspension, which you have the opportunity to do um, in circumstances where there may be hazardous working environments. So in a situation where medical suspension may apply under the Employment Rights Act, individuals are entitled to pay for up to 26 weeks. That's where it's very limited. It connects to the legislation around uh, control of sub, uh, hazardous substances, the lead regulations and radion regulations. So I don't think that those would be connected to coronavirus. If any of your staff are saying, I have the right to be medically suspended and to receive pay for up to 26 weeks. Pregnant women, however, is a different thing altogether. Because of the definition under the uh, Management of Health and Safety at Work regs and the Maternity and Parental Leave regs, it makes reference to biological issues in the workplace that could create a hazardous working environment. Coronavirus will be included within that. So I take the view that if you have to medically suspend an employee because their workplace is in fact hazardous as a result of coronavirus, then they would be entitled to pay at home of course, before the period of maternity leave. Um, that will be everything that I was going to say um, about uh, sick pay and suspension. Um, obviously, if you've got an individual who is suspended from work due to medical reasons due to pregnancy, it's also the case that if that's six weeks before their maternity leave is due to commence, and then leave automatically commence early so that's something you also need to consider so bringing that section to an end do you want to let olivia know if you've got any questions on that before we move on to termination of employment Okay, if anyone's got any questions, just pop them in the group chat. Can't see any coming through. You can always, okay, if you think of yeah. them, you can do it at the end. Okay, I have got one. So can we pay company sick pay if we if we want to, if a person has gone into self-isolation due to family concerns? Yeah, I mean, ultimately you can, if you want to, make such a payment, but obviously that individual is not presumably sick themselves. Um, I think when I went through whether or not company sick pay would be payable, it's very much based on the fact that there has to be some form of sickness rather than just um, self-isolation um, for concerns. But if you wanted to as a company, there's absolutely no reason why you, wouldn't, you couldn't do that if you wish to do so. Okay, if somebody is self-isolating because they say they have asthma, is SSP payable to them? So they're part of the vulnerable group, so no they're not. If they're working from home, you will obviously still continue to pay them, and then you need to think about whether or not if they're going to be because remember the vulnerable group have been advised to socially distance for 12 weeks. So you could consider furloughing those individuals. Okay. Um, if an employee is not working from home, but having to look after children, what do they get? If they're not working from home and they're looking after children, then it's dependents. Obviously they have the right to time off for dependents. That's unpaid leave. Okay. If, sorry, skipping. If they are on SSP and then the company shuts, is that furlough payment, i.e. the 80%? No, if you've got somebody who is off sick, um, it is the case that they can't be furloughed because they're out of the business for an alternative reason and they should continue to receive their sick pay, whether that's SSP or company sick pay. Okay. If you are part of a vulnerable group and can't work from home, are you entitled to company sick pay? I think we've addressed that one. Haven't we? It's come through as a different one, but yes, I'm just reading. Um, okay, I think that's all I've had. 
um, about statutory sick pay, I think. Yeah. Yeah, happy to move on. We move on. Oh, oh hang on. Someone's jumping the gun a little bit. Yeah. Um, yeah, so this one is based around furlough. Do you want to hang on to that one until you get on to furlough, Sally? Yeah, I think so. Let's just deal with termination first and then we'll do the, the whole session because as well, I've prepared some sort of questions around furlough as well that okay. might answer some of the questions that they've got already. Okay, fine. Right. Thank you. Yeah. So let's move on to termination. Again, guys, if you've got other questions on any of these sections that we haven't dealt with now, we'll deal with it as a roundup bit at the end. So just moving on to termination. The fact that all of this is going on, there's a real possibility that you'll look to terminate contracts of employment. Some of the questions that I've had is in those situations where you've got somebody that's socially distancing, i.e. I'm telling you I'm not coming to work for my own safety because I've been advised to do so by the government, but I'm technically not ill. Um, people asking, well, does that frustrate the contract? So in terms of frustration of the contract, that's where one party cannot um, comply with the terms of the contract so for example it might happen where somebody unfortunately dies or in a circumstances where somebody's imprisoned and they cannot comply with the terms of their contract sometimes that can lead to an argument that the contract has actually been frustrated now people are asking well in that situation where people can't work and um, they are for example social distancing does that frustrate the contract and my answer to that is that I don't believe it will the tribunal will set down and the law sets down clear parameters of special circumstances in where there will be a, fr a frustration. And I don't believe that the coronavirus would be um, something that would lead to people being able to argue that the contract's frustrated. So just dealing with that point. Um, however, um, if you've got an individual who says that they're self-isolating for a very long period of time um, and the company is not closing, so it's not a redundancy situation, you may take the view because they're not prepared to come to work because they are socially distancing or self-isolating that you will dismiss them. And if you were, you could rely on some of the, some other substantial reason as the fair reason to terminate employment. So that's something you just have in the background of your mind. If you have somebody who's staying at home, uh, who's really not entitled to, but they're saying I'm going to socially distance or I'm going to self-isolate through the entire period of this virus. Um, in terms of how it's affecting everybody, then that could be an angle that you could use to terminate. Um, health and safety. Um, if an employer, however, dismisses somebody because they're staying at home when they've got no right to be at home, um, but they are saying that you cannot provide a safe working environment, and in that we looked at a couple of examples that I went, to pre went through previously, including pregnant workers, um, and they were dismissed as a result of that. They would, however, have a, an automatic unfair dismissal claim, um, which they do not need to have two years service, and there's no cap on um, compensation if they were to uh, be successful. Um, obviously, the one that's probably on everybody's mind in terms of a reason to terminate would be redundancy. Um, if the business closes, then redundancy obviously um, would be uh, option under Section 139 of the Employment Rights Act. But Section 139 does not deal with the situation where there's the closure for say three weeks, because at the moment, of course, we've got pubs and restaurants um, currently shut, and they're saying that there's going to be this possibility of that for three weeks, or whether it's for longer than that in 12 weeks. Um, but uh, in that situation, it doesn't stop you, even if there's no business closure, um, from either availing yourself of the furlough scheme or looking where you still can make redundancies across your organisation should you wish to do so. So that's still an option if you're having difficulties uh, within the business. Some of the questions that I've had um, have been around collective redundancy consultation because there may be large numbers of employees who are affected by this. And we all know that if you're proposing to dismiss more than 20 employees within a 90 day period or more than 99 employees, it's a 30 day or 45 day consultation period. Now, in these situations, it would be impracticable really to do that period of consultation where businesses are really affected immediately by COVID-19. Um, so there's a special circumstances defence um, under the Trade Union and Labour Reform Consultation that you rely on if you cannot go through all the hurdles of the long-term consultation that's required. However, 
that will only come into play if you have still um, appointed employee reps or tried to undertake some form of consultation with trade union representatives if you recognise trade union. I would suggest, and I have nothing here in terms of, of, of law that says this, but I would suggest that the period you'd be looking to consult for would be about 14 days with employee reps or TU reps. That really deals with termination. Has anybody got any questions on that? Obviously, we're going to go on to look at layoff and short time. We're going to look at furlough. But is there any questions around um, termination? I have had a couple of questions, but I think they were kind of um, on the back of the statutory sick pay bit. So can I just go over a couple of those? Um, yeah. We sent someone home due to him going uh, undergoing cancer treatment. Does he get SSP? So that's an individual who is deemed to be a vulnerable worker. That's right, isn't it? Because they're, they're within the vulnerable group. Um, in that situation, if you have sent them home, then you will be required to pay them. Um, and then it's a matter for you as to whether you exercise statutory sick pay or company sick pay. Okay. Um, if you have somebody who has been off on SSP, but they want to return to work at the end of the month, but the business is closed, can they then be furloughed or do they have to stay on SSP? They can be furloughed. So we'll come on to looking at that and the options okay. that you've got with furlough, yeah? Yeah. Okay, Any, anyone got any questions specifically around terminations? Um, are you able to prioritise part-time or zero-hour workers when making redundancies? Um, as ever, Zero hours is less, less of an issue, but if you are only selecting part-time workers, you may fall foul of the part-time workers' regulations, obviously, by way of treating them less favourably as a group because you've selected them over full-time workers. So there's always that risk if you're just going to single out that grouping. Okay, I'll just leave it a little bit longer in case there's any more termination questions. If not, we can move on. I think that's it, Sally. Yeah, happy to move on. Yeah. Oh, hang on. No, sorry. Sorry. <laughs> um, oh, I think that's okay. So it's from the same person that asked about the zero hours, um, the zero hour workers. Is that the case even when we are closed and may not be able to support all? So what was the, what was the question again? What are they asking in relation to? Are you able to prioritise part-time or zero-hour workers when making redundancies? Even if, so in the situation where the business is closed, yes. any time any time where you're singling a certain group out, for example, if you said we're going to single out all of the people on maternity leave, or we're going to single out certain um, gender, there is a risk, there is always a risk that there may be a claim arising from that. But ultimately, if you are able to establish that there was a business need for the workers that you retained, then if the, if the matter is challenged in the tribunal, then that's how you would need to try and run your argument. But there is, of course, a risk. Okay. Um, I think that's it then. Um, yeah. Can move on, Sally. Yeah, thank you. Okay, so layoff and short time working. So we all know about the furlough scheme, which we'll talk about in a minute. But aside of that, it's still the case that layoff and short time working are options open to you in the current climate. So what's layoff and what's short time working? Layoff is where you will lay off your staff and they do not do any pay on any particular day. Short time is where you reduce the amount of hours and pay respectively the staff that you have working for you. Now, I'm uncertain as to those of you that have got a express clause in the contract that allows you to uh, lay off or place employees on short time working. If you do not, the question arises as to whether you can imply a layoff clause. Um, in that situation, for you to be able to do so, the courts will say there has to be a custom of layoff and that it has to be reasonable, certain and notorious. Um, therefore, it's not going to be probably the case for many organisations if you don't have a layoff and short time working clause uh, that you can Im simply imply one for the purposes of uh, laying people off or putting them on short time, which means you would need to seek their agreement. If you have such a clause, then obviously you can implement it in line with, just getting rid of my phone there, in line with 
um, the statutory scheme uh, by placing them on uh, for if well if you then for example were to that's gone if you were for example, I'm just gonna take that off the hook were to place any employee uh, on short on layoff for example for four consecutive weeks or six out of 13 three of which need to be consecutive then the employee can apply to you for a redundancy payment so it doesn't matter whether or not you've got the contractual right to do it or no right to do it under the contract. That statutory framework. The reason why people put a clause in the contract to allow for layoff in short time is so that you're not in breach of contract when you implement it. Now, after those periods have gone by, if, for example, somebody was laid off for four weeks consecutively, they can write to their employer and say, uh, I believe I'm entitled to a redundancy payment. And the employer would be required to pay that redundancy payment unless the employer writes back to the employee very quickly and says that within a four week period, they will be able to provide the employee with 13 weeks uninterrupted work, in which case you don't have to pay the redundancy payment. Um, if there are any days where the individual is laid off without work, then you still have the uh, right to be able to pay guarantee payments that's a right to have five days paid in any three month period, but the pay is only 29 pounds per day. And from the 6th of April, it goes up to 30 pounds per day. So it's a very, very small amount of money. Clearly in those situations, it may be better to furlough your employees, which we'll, we'll have a look at. Um, if you place your employees on short time, the statutory framework around the four week and 13 week periods where the employee can claim the redundancy payment will not come into play if you do not reduce the employee's pay by more than 50% of a week's pay. So for example, if I said to staff, right, we're going to reduce your hours and pay by 20%, then you could reasonably carry that on for a reasonable period without being in breach of contract if you've got a layoff and short time working clause or if the employees consent to it and without them being able to claim the redundancy within the statutory framework. I know that bit's quite complex so I'm happy to take any questions on that bit. Um, now I'm saying, yeah. Okay, I have had a question. I think again, it was relating to the topic before and I just missed it as you started again. So I'll just pick that one up. We, we have some temps with two plus years service. Could, mm -hmm. Should we make them redundant first? If you're temporary workers, then you can select them as a group, yeah. Okay, um, somebody's just asked if you could repeat the bit just All before, of it? I, I, I think it, I think it was a little bit crackly at some points. Which bit do you want me to repeat? Just clarify on the questions to Olivia and then I'll. Um, reduce pay slash hours, please. So, so under short time working, if you have somebody that you want to reduce their pay and their uh, uh, hours, and it's not by more than 50%. So I gave you the example of, let's say I want to reduce somebody's pay in hours by 20%, and I've got the right to do that under the contract, so I don't need to get their consent, because I've got a layoff and short time working clause, then I can continue that reasonably for a reasonable period of time without the statutory framework kicking in for them to claim the redundancy payment. And the reason being that the statutory framework for them to claim a redundancy payment when they're short time working is that it only triggers the entitlement if they ha we have reduced their pay by more than 50%. Okay. Okay. That's I think so. Um, let me just pick up a couple of others. Um, if we don't have short term working or a layoff clause, can we request this after it's started? Um, you will need to seek consent. If you've just implemented it, then I would suggest that it's kind of accepted that the employees have gone along with it and consented by, by their own conduct, if that makes sense. If you've already implemented it but not got their consent, then there may be some deemed consent, unless, of course, any of the employees have 
protested and informed you they're not going to accept it, but they'll carry on taking the pay in the interim, which is really unlikely. Um, it would be better if you can before implementing it, if you don't have a layoff or short term working clause, that you get the employee's consent first. Okay. We have, <clears throat> excuse me, we have contracts stating your hours may vary depending on the needs of the company. What does that enable us to do? Um, that, that enables you to reasonably vary the hours, but it's not a carte blanche right for you to just suddenly say, right, you're only getting 70% of your hours and pay. You would need a proper layoff and short time working clause in the contract to be able to do that. So I don't think you'd be able to rely on that clause. Okay. This is a long one. It's about furlough. Um, Should we push that one forward to the next session or? Just quickly reading it. Yeah, I, I, I think I'm going to, um, it's one from Cathy, just for your information, Cathy. I think we're going to leave that one until we get to the furlough section, if that's okay. Um, another one about layoff and short time working. So we have layoff and short time working in contract, but no specific details. We would presumably just comply with statutory entitlement. Is more detail needed in our contracts? Um, no, I mean, you, your clause could be as simple as, as saying something along the lines of we have the right to lay you off or reduce your pay if there is a downturn in work or a business need to do so. You don't need to have lots of detail in there. The point is, is it needs to refer to your right to be able to reduce or not off work if there's a diminution in work. So anything simple as that would be fine. Okay, I think we're up to date on yeah. questions apart from the one about furlough, but as we said, we will pick that one up when we get on to the furlough section. Just so, so we're clear as well, just to cover off the question that I know a client asked me the other day, if um, somebody's on sick leave, can they then be That's what you would then do. Any more? Sally, yeah, I, I, yeah, I thought that was it. Um, you kind of cracked out a little bit again, and we literally heard the first bit and then your very last two words. I think that's the same for everybody. I've okay, got a few so laughing faces on the screen. <laughs> okay. So. Okay. So let's go over that again. If you have somebody. Um, who is off on sick leave um, and then can they therefore be laid off and the answer is no if they are absent for sickness then they're absent for sickness and they can't be laid off unless of course they present fit to work and then you can lay them off but you can't be both okay that was clear Better? thank you yeah Okay, I think um, leave it for questions for now then and happy. T okay, sorry, I've got another question. Okay, I have an employee who is in receipt of ESA. Is there any way she can be included in the furlough arrangement? Future work is uncertain due to the nature of her health. Yes. You need to designate, we'll, we'll come on to furlough now and whether we can designate people as furlough, yeah? Okay, yeah, let's move on to furlough then. Thank you. Okay, so does everybody um, understand the furlough scheme? I think they do in terms of um, the fact that the government has raced through this, this uh, uh, option of a scheme where they will meet 80% of the employee's pay. Um, at this moment we've got very very little guidance on it so please bear with me if what we discussed today changes i'm sure we can do an update session on it once we've got more uh, flesh on the bones so to speak um but at present we can designate employees as furlough workers in that situation we can then send those employees home effectively and claim up to 80% of their salary up to a statutory cap of £2,500 per month and the, and the government will reimburse. Now that's initially put in place as a scheme for three months, backdated to the 1st of March uh, and then the, com uh, the government have said that they may extend it if it's necessary. It will only apply to individuals 
who are PAYE. Okay, so a lot of the questions that I've had from clients have been around um, directors, for example, who may receive dividends and also a small amount paid through PAYE. To be clear, their PAYE element would be furloughable, if that's such a word. I'm just making words up now. Um, but the dividends would not. But employees who are registered for PAYE on your payroll are all individuals that could be furloughed appropriately. Um, will it apply to people who've already been dismissed? That's a question I've been asked a lot. So you've already gone ahead and cut some jobs because you had to, quite frankly. And as a result of that, you're now saying, are these individuals that effectively we would like to furlough? Um, we're not sure about that yet. I would like to think that the government guidance, because it's designed to help individuals who would be made redundant, uh, would say that anybody that's been dismissed as a result of COVID-19 could come back to work and then be furloughed. It would be great because that's what the purpose of this scheme is. But we're waiting for guidance on that and we're not exactly sure at the, at the present time. All UK businesses are eligible for this, except for public sector, local councils, etc. Now, um, in order to invoke the scheme, you have to designate employees as furlough workers. If you have in your contract of employment a layoff and short time working clause, a bit like what we've discussed earlier, uh, then you can implement this without the need to have the consent of the employees. So you can simply issue a letter, and I've been drafting letters for clients to send out, issue a letter to the staff that confirms what you're doing and what their entitlements are. If you do not have a layoff and short time working clause, then you will need to seek consent of the employee for them to be furloughed. Now, it's highly unlikely uh, that they will say no, because if they say no, they're either going to get made redundant or sent home and laid off with no pay. So it's highly likely they will agree, but you'll need to make sure you follow that step if you haven't got a layoff and short time working clause. In addition, if you've got a layoff or short time working clause in your contract, you do not have to pay the 20% additional uplift because remember the government will pay 80%. You do not have to pay the 20% if you've got a layoff and short time working clause. If you haven't, then you may be obliged to pay the 20% unless you get the consent of the employees not to. And again, it's likely that employees will agree that rather than face a layoff with no pay or a redundancy situation. But just to be clear, that's how that will work. Um, what payments are included? Um, the £2,500 at the present time, my understanding is, is it includes all employers' costs. So that means it includes employers' national insurance, pensions, benefits, and then obviously employees' uh, tax and national insurance would need to be applied to that. But the maximum uh, is 80% of salary or £2,500 per month is the statutory cap. We're awaiting legislation more on how that would work. Um, the portal, unfortunately, to make claims is still not available. Apparently, they're writing the script for that, uh, for the software that's required. But we're hoping to have that in place by sort of mid-April uh, mid uh, for people to start claiming by the end of April, which means that in the intervening period, you will be required to make payments to the staff for you to then be able to claim it back. They're recommending that if you can't afford that, you may need to get a business loan. But I'm not quite sure how easy it is to get a business loan at this stage. Um, is it unreasonable to dismiss for redundancy if furlough is available? Um, there's no clear answer on this, and it's something I've advised on even today, where we had a client of mine who uh, wanted to make an individual redundant, but then said, well, do I have to now furlough them? No, it, I've advised that in that situation, that individual you wanted to re remove from your structure anyway, and to proceed with the redundancy rather than placing them on furlough. But again, there's no clear guidance on that at this stage. Um, it might help now if I just run through a few questions because it might answer some of the questions that you've had coming in. So just doing these one by one, the Chancellor's statement refers to the payment being made if the employer cannot afford to pay them. Will this be a means tested payment for employers? The advice in this is very, very unlikely. They're not going to sit down and go through your accounts to decide whether or not you, can, uh, you could have afforded to pay them and then they will pay you back. This is going to be a situation where you know if you're furloughing individuals and doing the right thing then you will be able to be uh, recompensed by the government what is most important 
is that if you do furlough employees, they do not carry out any work at all. And I'll deal with what happens if you want to swap them around. Um, but they should not be carrying out any work at all. And I think that's an area where uh, HMRC will look to clamp down on people if, for example, they've got people working and claiming the 80%. Uh, because it is, it is possibility, uh, a possibility of uh, people abusing this. Does the furlough scheme apply to short-time working or only those fully laid off? It's those that are only fully laid off. So if you, for example, have some people on short time, they would not be eligible for the furlough scheme. You'll be responsible for whatever percentage of salary you are paying them. Do employers have to pay the employees as normal for March and April? Uh, we don't know as yet, but we believe that you will have to and then reclaim. Can you force an employee to be furloughed? If you have a layoff and short time working clause in the contract, yes. If not, then you'd need to seek the consent of the employee for designating them furloughed. How do you choose which employees to furlough? That's a matter for you. Some people have indicated about um, those that are perhaps temporary workers. Um, but you'll need to have some form of system and full note made of why you've selected some people over others. And it could be as simple as there are some individuals who are seen as essential workers to the business. So you will not be furloughing those, but you will be furloughing those perhaps in an admin role that you don't need or something like that. Can you prioritise elderly and vulnerable employees? I think somebody asked this question. Can you prioritise elderly and vulnerable employees? Uh, when deciding to furlough and yes I think you probably can there's a possible claim isn't there that if you say we're going to look after the vulnerable workers first who may be elderly that the younger workers are not placed in the same situation but I think any sort of claim that goes forward on that basis in this current mark climate would not be perhaps received very well by the tribunal because it'll be the company trying to do the right thing and protect people's health and safety now can you rotate furlough workers okay now my understanding is we've got, there's nothing at the present, but what I've been advising clients at the moment is that I can appreciate that you may initially take a decision to furlough and then circumstances might change. Let's say, for example, the supply chain um, gets going again and actually you've got a requirement for people to return to work. In that situation, I believe that the guidance may well, or the legislation may well say, they can come back to work and they'll be no longer furloughed, but if you then try to put them back as furloughed again, that probably won't work. So there's an opportunity to furlough people, bring them in if you need them, but once you've brought them in, it's likely you won't be able to furlough them again, which means you may have to then either lay them off or put them on short time working, which you could possibly do again at 80%, but this time, of course, you wouldn't be able to recover the 80% of their salary. Uh, what if an employee has two jobs? Well, they can be furloughed from both jobs. Um, what about, however, um, if somebody decides to get another job uh, because they're furloughed? So they're being furloughed, they're staying at home uh, and having a jolly old time not working. Um, and then they go and get a job somewhere else. And they've got even more income coming in. In that situation, I would think you're probably looking at a gross misconduct issue because the employee has to be available to you to work and devoted to your business, even though they're not physically attending at work. Uh, how do we deal with people who are required to come to work and they're getting 100% of their pay when you've got people sitting at home and they're getting 80% but doing no pay? That is a really tough one because there's nothing in law, I don't think, that's going to be um, for those employees to be able to rely on to bring a claim. But I think it's going to be a difficult HR management issue with people perhaps unhappy about the fact that they've been required to come to work, whereas others can sit at home in the eyes, in, in the eyes of that person and be paid 80%, which means that you might think about things like, you might grant them some additional holiday pay when this is all over. You might, you might grant them an additional bonus when this is all over, or you may pay them slightly more than 100% to compensate for the fact that they are coming in rather than sitting at home with 80%. But there's no obligation for you to do this. I'm just putting those out as ideas if you've got lots of complaints. Um, how is the 80% calculated if they've got irregular hours? Uh, before the 6th of April, it'll be based on a 12-week average. And after that, it'll be the 52-week average, which we know is coming into force anyway, so from the 6th of April. Um, does the 80% mean that employees might get paid less than national minimum wage? That's not my understanding, and that's not what the intention of this is. Does holiday continue to accrue? Yes, it does. 
Can employers require employees to take holiday during furlough? Yes, you can. And will it be at 80%? Arguably, yes, it will be. We'll need to have that in the legislation, but arguably, yes, it will be. Can I require employees to take holiday rather than them asking to take holiday? Yes, you can. Of course, under the Working Time Directive, you can give double the amount of notice. So if you wanted somebody to take a week's holiday, they're not asking, but you want them to take it during this furlough period, you must give two weeks notice for them to do so, and be, that, that will become part of their holiday entitlement that they've taken. Can employees on long-term sick announce they want to return to work to take advantage of the furlough scheme? I would say arguably no, because obviously they're just trying to uh, do themselves uh, into a better position of having 80% uh, pay rather than the statutory sick pay or company sick pay, depending on which way it is. Um, and therefore it's not intended that that would be um, acceptable. Is it a breach of confidence, trust and confidence if you don't pay the 20%? No, it isn't for the reasons that I've said above, but please beware if you don't have a layoff or short time working clause. Um, can you continue with disciplinary and grievance procedures while they're furloughed? Yes, I think you will be able to um, because it's associated to the employment, even though they're not carrying out any work. But again, we're hoping for more guidance on that uh, when we get the legislation through. But I think the indication is that because it arises under the contract of employment, you should still be able to continue with those uh, types of processes. Can employees currently on maternity, paternity or shared parental leave cut their absence short so that they can be automatically furloughed to increase their pay because of course after six weeks they would go down to its maternity for example down to the SNP rate whereas they could be getting 80% of their salary now um, my understanding is is that obviously they can get obviously by law they can give eight weeks notice to return early that can be a shorter period if you agree for them to return early and I see no reason why if they were to do that you wouldn't then be able to furlough them and they would get 80% of their pay Sally yeah can I just interject um, just 100 million we've, questions we've got about 30 questions come in on this topic so um, I'm really gonna try my best as I am not an employment law specialist to um, pick out any that haven't been covered but if I repeat myself then please forgive me um, yeah. is it okay just to go through a few of those now yes Okay, um, so one I don't think has been covered. Are we able to offer pension holiday during the furlough period? Well, pension should still be payable and form part of that calculation for the two and a half thousand. Okay, we have employees on furlough and our holiday year is due to end on the 30th of April. Would we carry over the bank holiday and any other holiday allowance or under these exceptional circumstances, could we pay the holiday? So no, you won't be able to pay the holiday because that will be um, a breach of the working time directive. But before I said to you, you can give instruction to the employees that they've got to take that holiday um, under the working time directive, give double the amount of notice. So if it's one bank holiday, for example, you'd need to give two days notice. If it's more than that, that they, you know, they've got a crude holiday of, say, five days, you'd need to give 10 days notice for them to actually informing them that they've got to take the holiday. So then you won't end up with lots of people carrying over holiday which will make it more difficult for you once this hopefully is all over and we're all back at work. Okay. Can an apprentice be put on furlough? Any fixed term worker can be put on to furlough. So for example, trainee solicitors can be put on to uh, furlough status. So yeah. Okay. We've got a few questions around um, bringing people back from furlough, but I think we yeah. sort of covered that. Um, so just to be clear, my view at the moment and it is subject to legislation so uh, you know this may change as it might do in my relation to my answers concerning apprenticeships but my, my view at the moment is is that it would make sense that if you furloughed somebody you can then bring them back in if circumstances change but what i don't think you can do is then furlough them again as a sole director with an employed role can i be furloughed but still fulfill basic director duties um well you, you're running the business is there an element of your pay that's processed through PAYE, which that it normally is, there's a small amount that's processed through PAYE, um, and the remainder paid is by way of dividends, for example. Um, then the PAYE element that you pay, yes, can be furloughed. Any other payments, no. Is the 2,500 furlough payment net of statutory deductions? 
So that's to include all costs. So it will, the 2,500 is the cap, and that will include, if you, if you work out underneath it, pension, um, employers national insurance contributions, employees national insurance contributions, all of that needs to come out as part of the 25. Yeah? Yeah. Um, does it apply to workers rather than just employees? Employees only. Okay. Um, okay, I think yeah, we've done that. Yeah, we've done that. <clears throat> okay. okay. Um, we don't have a layoff or reduced hours clause in our contracts. We have a number of staff who have agreed to be furloughed. What do we need to do in terms of getting their consent? Is there a template document we can use? Yeah, I've got documents that people can access if they want to, whereby they can yeah, put, issue it to them and they'll consent to being furloughed and that will be all you need to be placed on the personnel file. Okay. We want to furlough from the 1st of April, but we have a variation clause saying changes need 30 days, but we also have a short time layoff clause. Therefore, can we go ahead on the 1st of April? Yes, you can. Rely, don't, don't worry about the variation clause, just worry about the layoff and short time one. And it's that one that you're relying on and citing to invoke the furlough. Does the business need to prove financial hardship to qualify for the payment? No. What about employees whose gross salary at 80% is higher than the 2,500? Do we need to top it up to their 80% or do they need to drop to the 2,500? So if you've got a layoff and short time working clause, you haven't got to top up the 20%. If you have, sorry, if you have got a layoff and short time working clause, you haven't got to, <laughs> you haven't got to top up the 20%. If you haven't, then you may have to, unless you agree it with the employee that you don't have to. And that's gonna be a simple equation of, we can't afford it, so you're either made redundant, we'll lay you off without pay at all, or you can agree to this and consent to it, which is that everything has got to be just 2, 000, up to 2,500. Okay. Um, we know that the employee has to receive the minimum wage if furloughed. Do we get all of the money back or just 80% of the normal pay? Well, you will have to, and we don't know how the portal works yet, but you will have to put in all the information about their salary. Um, and I presume then you will be reimbursed 80% of their salary, including of course, all the costs within that two and a half, um, up, yeah, up to the maximum of two and a half. I think that's how it's going to work. We just haven't got any information on how the portal will work at this stage. Does an employee need to give consent for furlough if the employer is putting them on full pay? Um, if the employer wants to claim 80% back, then yes. Can you furlough bank workers? Yes. Yeah. If uh, they're on your PAYE, then yes. If they're on an agency's PAYE, then the agency will do that. Right. Can you furlough an employee off sick? Oh, sorry, I've got that wrong. Apologies if you've said this, but can you furlough an employee off sick? But would likely to be furloughed at work. I'm not quite I don't, sure I get that one, I'm afraid. You can't furlough someone that's off sick because they're already off. It's a bit like layoff. You can't just suddenly say we're furloughing you because actually they're absent for a different reason rather than layoff. This, so let, let's make it clear. The furlough scheme is designed to be used for those people that you would be laying off and making redundant. So either laying them off because you've got no work or you're making them redundant. That's what this scheme is designed for, not for people who have been off sick and then to suddenly decide that they're well enough and they should be furloughed. If we have work for staff to do at present, but won't have work for them in a few weeks, can we furlough at this stage? Yeah, the scheme's for three months from the 1st of March at the moment, but may be extended. Okay, we're starting furlough on the 1st of April, but will we be able to claim back the total three months as obviously it's starting on the first of first March. March. Yeah, we're not clear about that yet, but I think possibly yes. But we're not, it's, that's not clear at this stage and we haven't got any legislation on it yet. Okay. Do employees continue to accrue annual leave? Yes. If someone is on suspension, can we put them on furlough leave? Yes. Will furlough payments be made if PAYE is outstanding, brackets not paid? Sorry, repeat that one again. 
Will furlough payments be made if PAYE is outstanding in brackets not paid? No, the purpose of this is that you will make the payments to the employees and you will then recover it back. So you can't not pay them and then pay them when you've put the process, process it through the portal, if that makes sense. That's why I said you may have to access loans if you're struggling to make those payments at this stage. Okay. I, I am trying to get through the questions as quickly as possible, everyone. I really do want to make sure you get your specific questions answered. So just keep bearing with me. I am going down the list. If someone is self-isolated due to living with a vulnerable person, can you put them as a furloughed worker? Well, you can, you can put uh, someone that's socially distancing um, as a furlough worker. Presumably in that situation, is it somebody self-isolating because they're living with somebody who is, is supposed person. to... Mm. Mm -mm -mm. I suppose you could furlough them. You could furlough them if they're gonna, if they're gonna isolate because of the 12 weeks, you could furlough them. Okay. But, but, but you've got to come back to the fact that this is being put in place for those people that you're laying off rather than somebody that chooses not to come to work. Okay. Um, please can you just confirm about asking staff on furlough to take holiday? Do we have to pay them in full during this holiday? No, my, I think my understanding, and we're waiting for the legislation, but my understanding is, is if obviously one way around not having lots of holiday build up and then be left with having to pay 100% for the holiday would be to instruct them to take holiday during furlough and then the holiday would be paid at 80%. Right. We don't have a clause in our contract for layoff. We have drawn up an agreement for each employee to agree and to sign. Is this okay? Yep. Okay. Are apprentices on PAYE included in the furlough scheme? I think that was answered. We dealt with that one, yet. yeah. Yeah. Um, will the three months period end three months from the 1st of March or from three months from when you start to furlough people? 1st of, 1st of March, from the 1st of March, but it may be extended by the government. I'm becoming a pro. I can answer some of these myself. You can do this. You can do this. Can furlough be backdated? Uh, Again, we've just dealt with that one. Um, there's no certainty around that. I would hope that they would allow people to make claims from the 1st of March onwards. Otherwise, given that it was only announced on the 20th of March and they've backdated it to the 1st of March, it, would make, it wouldn't make any sense why they've backdated it. Okay. Can we set I would hope so. Can we set a time limit on furlough or would, would it need to be for the full period, e.g. to the end of June? No, you can bring it to an end after a month if you wanted to, after six weeks, if you had a need for people to come back into the business. Can an employee work for another business if they are furloughed through their current role? No, they shouldn't be working for a third party. Okay. What happens if you only have enough work for people to work 50% of their usual working week, but you need them all in as you have a small team? Uh, well, that would be short time working rather than furlough. Okay. If a director is furloughed, how do they prove that the fulfilment of director duties is not doing work for the employer? Uh, are they trying? I don't understand the question. Just read the question again. If a director is furloughed, how do they prove that the fulfilment of the director duties is not doing work for the employer? Mm, that's a tough one. We, I think we'll have to wait for the legislation on that because obviously doing no work at all is what's required. But then you've got an overarching statutory duty to, um, to actually complete your director's duties. So I think, that, I think we'll need to wait and see what happens then in relation to that in terms of the legislation. Can you furlough those on zero hour contracts? Uh, yes. And your calculation would be based on if they're regular, if the people who regularly work for you on zero hours, the previous 12 weeks and obviously from the 6th of April it'll be a 52 week calculation for the average for a week's pay. Okay. How can we access the template, yeah, the template document you mentioned earlier Sally, I think a couple of people are wanting access to that. That You can just get your my details from Olivia. Okay, just email um, myself or um, email the events email address that I mentioned earlier which is events at hwchamber.co.uk um, and let us know what you're after and I'll put you in touch with Sally. Can you clarify the situation um, with my employee in receipt of ESA, please? So employment support allowance, presumably this is an individual who, is it somebody who's got, do you want, I don't know, if, who's the individual that um, I don't is know. asking the questions? 
Is it somebody with a disability? I don't know, unfortunately. Right, okay. And just right. give me the question again, Olivia. Just can so I can do and try and... Can you clarify the situation with my employee in receipt of ESA, please? So whether or not they can be furloughed, um, if they are, it, it, employment support allowance, I believe, I believe is to do with um, health issues. And if it's somebody that's off sick, then they're off for that reason rather than being furloughed, unless they then declare themselves fit, which you could then furlough them, if that makes sense. Can we pay employees 100% of the salary, even if this is above the 2,500? Um, you can only, well, you can only claim back 80%. So if you want to pay more than that, that's entirely up to you. Okay. Car allowance payments and other benefits? All included within the 2,500. If you can't rotate furlough leave on and off, how does SSP work if someone is sick? comes back and then they're on furlough, but then they're off on sick again. Do they stay on furlough? No, they'd go to sickness. Okay, thank you. To what extent can furlough only be applied to employees who would otherwise be made redundant? Could we furlough a highly paid employee in a less affected department to manage our overall costs and, re and avoid redundancies? Yes. If you want to designate somebody as furlough, you can, as long as you understand they cannot carry out any work for you. Can someone on minimum wage only receive 80% furloughed, or is that against the law? What was, what was the question? Can someone on minimum wage only receive 80% furloughed, or is that against the law? No, the intention is, is that with the 80%, they would still be receiving the national minimum wage that's what the intention is we'll have to wait for the legislation to come out in terms of how the calculations are done because we're just we're blind on that at the moment yeah if you use a third party payroll company do they submit the payroll details through the portal or do we have to do it ourselves i think you'll need to check with the provider i think the provider will need to make a decision about whether they require you to do it but if they're doing all of their paway paye um uh, submissions it may well be that they can do it it, it will depend they, I think they'll need to check with the provider and until we've got the guidance and the legislation out it'd be difficult to say at this stage yeah if on suspension can we offer furlough leave we covered that yeah and that was a yes um, back to statutory sick pay can you clarify if SSP is payable to somebody self-isolating due to a family member contracting COVID-19 so in that situation, the government guidance is, is that you have to self-isolate. So in that situation, you should get statutory sick pay. So that's the NHS England. If you look at the NHS England advice on what you have to do on self-isolation, and that, that says you have to self-isolate for 14 days. So you would be able to access SSP from day one. What happens if you furlough someone who already has two jobs? The other person can furlough, the other job can furlough them too. If charity staff are on furlough but want to make a video to support clients on a voluntary basis and post this on the charity website, can they do this? Do you know what? Um, I've been asked that question and I'm, I'm really uneasy about saying yes just because um, anything that's connected to work, I, I wouldn't want the government to be able to say, well, actually, they were still doing stuff um, and therefore we're not going to pay it because what you want to do is make sure you get that 80% back to preserve as many jobs as possible. When furlough three month period expires, will we have to make staff redundant? If they do, well, that will very much depend on what the extension is. If the government extend it, say for another three months, you might keep them furloughed for another three months. If they don't extend it and you're not then in a position where you've got work, you've got diminished need, you could then make them redundant. Yeah, we've had another one about car allowance payments, um, which Sally clarified is included in the uh, 2,500. Can a, can a full-time worker be furloughed for some of their hours? No, you've got to be completely laid off. When is the legislation and furlough going to come out? I don't know, but I really hope it's quick. <laughs> Me too. It, it can't be that long. They're looking for the portal um, to be up and running sort of by mid-April. So, you know, it's going to be in the next couple of weeks. Yeah. Excuse me. If someone becomes ill while on furlough, do we still have to pay them sick pay at 
How do we move them from furlough to sick, then back to furlough? Sorry, so you've got somebody who's furloughed. If somebody becomes then ill become... whilst on furlough. Well, you can either, it depends, doesn't it? The com you, they may be entitled to company sick pay, which would have been paid at 100%, but you're paying them 80% anyway on furlough, so they could probably just continue on their 80%, yeah. unless, of course, they're entitled to statutory sick pay, and then we'll, I think we really need guidance on whether or not at that point they would switch to SSP or whether they'd just stay on furlough 80%. Because that's um, going to be a real pain to administer. And can they um, keep, can the employees keep in touch, A, with each other, and B, can the employees, um, the employer keep in touch with the employees whilst on furlough? Okay. So this is also something that I've dealt with because um, there's a real concern. There's two things. There's one, being socially in contact because obviously you have lots of friends at work and there's no problem in relation to that. As long as it's made clear that the discussions that you have should not be connected to work and at no point, I think the safest way to do it is to have as little work contact with individuals as possible but encourage obviously them to be socially interacting because it could be very isolating for them to be off and others to be at work. Okay. If an annual salary is the equivalent of national minimum wage, surely if the government only pay 80% and the employer does not choose to top up the other 20%, they are then not receiving the national minimum wage anymore. Isn't this underpaying them? Potentially, but you are being instructed to do this by the government um, and therefore you can't be held to be in breach of not paying national minimum wage if it is the case that that works out that way. Um, so I don't think you'll be prosecuted as a result of doing so. Can, can employees do online training during furlough? Uh, no, I would say no. Okay. Um, to clarify, if we owe HMRC for PAYE, national insurance, from the last three months, will we still be able to receive fur furlough payments? I think this was referring back to the question earlier. Just, re just repeat the question again, sorry. If we owe HMRC for the yeah. last three, from the last three months, will we still be able to receive furlough payments? So if they owe money? That I don't know. Okay. I don't know. I mean, obviously, we're talking about being able to backdate it. That's one thing to the 1st of March. But if you haven't been paying it anyway, um, because the whole point of this is that you will make the payments and then you will be reimbursed for it. Okay. If an employee has two roles within the same company, can they be furloughed for just one? Yeah, if, well, <laughs> I, think we have to, I think we'd have to wait for the guidance, but it makes sense that if you required them for one of the roles, but didn't require them for the other and would lay them off and make them redundant from the other, that you could potentially claim furlough for the other role. If redundancy applies after a three month furlough, will normal redundancy rules around consultation and redundancy pay? Yes. Subject to those comments that I made earlier about, you know, if you had to make emergency redundancies and your special defence in relation to that and, and what, what consultation requirements are for collective consultation. Do you need to collectively consult if you furlough staff and there isn't a layoff clause in the contract? So firstly, technically, yes, if you haven't got a layoff clause in the contract and you're, you're looking to it to apply to more than 20 employees, you sh or, or more than 99, you should collectively consult. But I, I think for, to go through a 30 day and a 45 day period could see the company go under. And it's one of those situations where I think you should, if you could just reasonably do as much consultation as possible and get consent, because obviously the longer it goes on, the more jobs that are at risk if the employees don't agree to it. Okay, um, interesting one. Can an employer choose to top up 20% for some staff, but not others? Ooh, that's harsh. Yes, they can, absolutely. But obviously you need to think about the HR implications of that. And I think this is the last one. I need a drink, I don't know about you. Um, can I just check that if people are self-isolating, but they are in the vulnerable group, that they do not get SSP? That's right, because they're socially distancing, not self-isolating, which is different. Okay. I'm just waiting for some more to pop up. Um, I think amazingly we've managed to get through, I think the majority of them, um, I apologize if I've missed any. Um, we've only lost a few people on the way as well, which is brilliant. There's still 90 of us in the group. So thank you all 
Oh, someone said thank you all very helpful. Thank you. So, thank, thank you, Sally. Yeah. Um, is there anything else um, that you want to cover, Sally, from your topics? I'm just aware we have run over. Um, we have run over time. No, but can I just say if there are any other questions or once we've got the legislation out and we know what we're doing, let's do another seminar and we can run through it all again. Yeah, the only thing I do want to say um, before everybody leaves is that I have, um, I have been recording this session. So um, what I'm going to ask our marketing department to do is to put this on LinkedIn. So if you go to um, Hereford and Worcester Chamber of Commerce and follow our LinkedIn group, I'm going to try and get it uploaded onto there or at least a link on there to our website so that it can be kind of watched over again. Um, what we then might do is, as Sally said, do another session because I'm very aware that there's so many questions that need answering. A reminder as well, if you want to um, get in touch with Sally and um, have any of those uh, templates or documents that she's referred to, if you can drop me an email at um, events at hwchamber.co.uk, then I will be able to collect that information and get it over to Sally so that she can be in touch. Um, I think I'm just going to, I've had a lot of thank you messages, but I just want to check. I haven't missed any, um, any questions. I have just got one more, Sally. If advised to self-isolate because vulnerable, aren't they eligible for SSP because it's COVID-19 related? Uh, that's the same, isn't it, about vulnerable groups and whether they're entitled to be paid SSP? Uh, no, because they're, self, they're not self-isolating, they're socially distancing, which is a different thing. Obviously, if they became ill, then they would be self-isolating and they would be entitled to it. Amazing. Um, I'm, literally, I'm literally just reading through the comments and everyone has been extremely thankful um, to you, Sally. So thank you so much. A lot of people asking for, um, for the link. Like I said, I will get it on LinkedIn. I will get it on our website. Somebody has suggested perhaps having another session um, when the legislation comes out. Really good idea. Um, I, th I think that's it, everyone. Um, a massive thank you to Sally. Really, genuinely, someone's just said appreciate all the information considering we actually don't know a lot of the answers, but you've managed to give them um, what seems has been desperately needed information. So clever you, well done. Thank you very much, Sally. Thank you all for joining. Um, we are going to have some other seminars based around different topics as well um, with some of our other patron members. If you want to um, keep an eye out for those, and come along to that we're going to cover things such as working from home re uh, remotely managing your IT um, looking after your teams as well obviously a, lo a lot of people are going through that in a transition at the moment too so keep an eye out for some more of our online sessions and we'll let you know um, when we've got another one with Sally Brooks in but thank you all um, enjoy the rest of the um, of the lovely sunny day thank you